It is a pleasure uh, to be here with you all this morning. I thank you for coming out so early to be here with me and with my fellow award recipients on this occasion. Let me confess that it has been with some difficulty that I have framed this presentation. I have in recent years seen a number of Topaz Medallion acceptance speeches, Lance Brown, Adele Santos, and Stanley Tigerman, uh, all very different from one another. Um, but the first Topaz acceptance speech I ever heard, and perhaps the most compelling one, was delivered in 1985 in the ballroom of the Vancouver Hyatt Hotel by Colin Rowe. Colin, in his inimitable style, took advantage of the occasion to deliver what, as far as I could tell, was an impromptu architectural commentary on the design features of the ballroom in which we all found ourselves. <laughs> Um, and by the way, I was a little startled, for those of you that were here on Thursday night, uh, when Jeff Kipnis threatened to steal this line of mine by complaining about the pattern of the uh, white dots on the ceiling here in Boston. He speculated whether they might have been intended to represent stars um, and concluded that he was wrong. And of course, he was wrong. Um, uh, because, of course, they're aligned in rows, which stars wouldn't be. And I, I wondered whether he might have been confused by some of the flecking off blue paint, which uh, <laughs> produces a few more white spots on the ceiling. In any event, I find myself thinking Colin Rowe would not have made the same mistake. And in any event, um, since Colin's performance was, as I have already said, inimitable, I will not attempt to match it here. As some of you in the room will be aware, I am of a generation that has had an easier opportunity to play roles in architectural practice as well as in architectural education than most of you younger people in the room have done. And since I will be making an acceptance speech, admittedly a much shorter one, at the AIA conference in Washington in May, I have decided to focus here not on my professional work, but on my theoretical and critical writings, and to do a sort of apologia pro mia vita, at least my theoretical and critical vita. I first went to architecture school in my hometown of Toronto and graduated in 1962. I want to point out to you that in this photograph, I am on a streetcar going to school. Toronto being one of the few cities in North America that didn't get rid of its streetcars in the 1950s. In fact, we still have them today. Um, I worked for two years in the office of a remarkable young Toronto architect of that time, Jerome Markson. You can see in this photograph with me on a construction site in the middle 1960s. But I was intellectually restless, and I decided to go back to school for further study. I also decided to go to London to do so, and I found myself there in the heady years from 1964 to 1967 as a doctoral candidate at the Bartlett School working under the direction of Robert Maxwell. Um, many of you will remember that Maxwell went on to become the dean at Princeton. Here, you see me and my wife, Elizabeth, uh, together uh, with another of my London mentors, Joseph Rickward, um, <clears throat> uh, and, Mary, and Jim Sterling's widow, the fourth person in the picture peeking out from behind Joseph's shoulder, is Mary Sterling, Jim Sterling's widow. It was Joseph Rickward who introduced me to phenomenology. Uh, interestingly enough, not Heidegger, uh, about whom the Polish Jew Rickward had always had decidedly mixed feelings, but instead Maurice Merleau-Ponty. In an early interpretive essay on the work of Alvar Aalto, I attempted to employ the precepts of phenomenology to frame a phenomenological construct I thought pertinent to Alto's work, 
one which I named the space of the balustrade. As it turned out, I never did finish the doctoral degree. But in 1967, I had the opportunity to publish some of my research when I guest edited an issue of the Architectural Association Journal, then called ARENA. Michael Hayes has just referred to this. On the theme, Meaning in Architecture, here is the cover of that issue, uh, together with a quotation from Aldo Van Eyck. Interestingly enough, a quotation also selected by Rem Koolhaas for his recent and compelling Chrono Chaos exhibition at the New Museum in Manhattan. Over the next two years, together with co-editor Charles Jenks, I turned this issue into an anthology, which I believe was one of the earliest manifestations of the discourse we now call architectural theory. Uh, this was the anthology, Meaning in Architecture, published in 1969. The essay of my own in both of these publications, as Michael has just pointed out, uh, was La Dimension Amoureuse, a title which was take a quotation from Roland Barthes uh, in respect to rhetoric. My theoretical ambition had been to employ the techniques of semiotics as they had been developed by French structuralist thinkers such as Barthes and Claude Lévi-Strauss to formulate an intellectually cogent method with which to discuss subtle issues of symbolism in architecture, and thus to challenge the rising uh, ascendant modalities of reductively rational functionalism in architecture as represented in those years by Christopher Alexander's first book, Notes on the Synthesis of Form. Among those who thought meaning in architecture was a significant intellectual turning point in contemporary architecture was Peter Eisenman, who encouraged its publication in the United States and who also reviewed it favorably in Peter Blake's now defunct magazine, Architecture. By this time, I had returned from London to Toronto and was pleased to be invited relatively frequently by Eisenman to participate in events at his new Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies in Manhattan. Here you see Eisenman and myself together with others at one such event. And I'm gonna, a little interpolation here. It occurred to me, uh, looking at this photograph, that Peter Eisenman should get a topaz medallion. Um, Michael said no one had had a greater influence on architectural education than me. Well, Peter Eisenman did. Um, and in fact, I'm, I'd have a hard time thinking of anybody who had a greater influence on American architectural education than Eisenman. So I'm calling for a future nomination for Eisenman for the Topaz. He has been a bad boy on more than one occasion, and, <laughs> and he's not exactly an ACSA kind of guy. <clears throat> but he does deserve a Topaz, and, I, and if someone in the room is game to uh, mount a nomination process, Sign me on to be one of the nominators. During the 1970s, Rickward invited me back to England from time to time to participate as a visitor in his new postgraduate program in architectural theory at the University of Essex. And on one such trip, my co-editor Jenks introduced me to a new young friend of his, then studying at the AA. <clears throat> this young friend was Rem Koolhaas. Koolhaas, his wife Madeline Wiesendorp and I also became friends, and it was on another of those trips that I was invited to contribute to an issue of architectural design that would feature the work of the then new Office of Metropolitan Architecture. Here you see my text in that issue, uh, together with a drawing of two young architects, quote, eating oysters naked with boxing gloves, um, <clears throat> a drawing made by Wiesendorp literally overnight to accompany my text, which quoted that passage from a text by Koolhaas. The OMA issue of architectural design appeared in 1977. I have been gratified recently to hear it described by Pierre Vittorio Aureli as one of the most prescient of the early commentaries on OMA. 
Interestingly enough, this issue of AD was quickly followed in 1978, one year later, uh, by another bellwether publication, Leon Creer's and Maurice Culot's Rational Architecture, the cover of which you see here. And hard though it is to, in retrospect to grasp the historical fact, um, in uh, <coughs> Creer's and Culot's publication, this one, included on successive pages work by both of the Creer brothers, as well as work by OMA, one consequential reason for this being the close professional relationship of both of those groups to their mutual mentor, Oswald Matthias Ungers. Now by this time, I had myself become quite interested in European rationalism, um, as represented by such figures as Carlo Imanino, Aldo Rossi, and Bernard Huet, not to mention, of course, Ungers himself. I had even attempted to apply the urban methods they had developed in their studies of European cities in a North American one, my own home city of Toronto. Thus was published in that same year, 1978, the issue of the Walker Art Center's Design Quarterly, edited by Barton Myers and myself, entitled Vacant Lottery. Uh, it was there that I published the essay, Vacant Lots in Toronto, in which I undertook a graphic historical analysis of a neighborhood in Toronto from the mid-19th century to the late 20th. In that text, I documented the problematic impact on the coherence of the urban form of the original 19th century neighborhood. Here you see a successive series of patterns of land division in the neighborhood in question. Um, <clears throat> I documented the problematic impact on the coherence of the urban form of the original 19th century neighborhood as over the decades, incremental replacement of older buildings by newer, denser ones, gradually, uh, gradually the building typologies being implemented shifted from a priority on coherent streetscape to a priority on light and view for occupants in the newer, denser, taller buildings. In response to this, I urged the formulation of design strategies for the neighborhood that could reconcile the then divergent objectives of amenity for the occupants of, origin, of individual apartments on the one hand, and the overall urban and spatial coherence of the neighborhood on the other. Judging by the number of times I have been in, recently been invited to lecture again on vacant lots in Toronto, it would appear that the argument of this text of mine has proved to have some intellectual and historical durability. But of course, the most influential publication of 1978 was not Creer's and Culot's Rational Architecture, uh, uh, but instead that of my Meaning in Architecture co-editor, Charles Jenks. This was his book, The Language of Postmodern Architecture, the cover of which you see here. I think it is fair to say that Jenks' book, in its innumerable printings, represents the beginning of the sweeping stylistic hegemony in our field of the phenomenon that came to be known as postmodernism. Now, as early as 1975, I had registered my own apprehension at the prospect of a new historicism in architecture. In a commentary, I was invited to submit to an opposition's forum that focused on Arthur Drexler's Museum of Modern Art exhibition, The Architecture of the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. But these apprehensions of mine, like those of many others in those days, were not enough to stem the tide of postmodernism that subsequently swept across the world of architecture, especially the Anglo-American one in which most of us have spent our academic careers. I watched in dismay as an architecture of meaning that, fo want, that focused only on iconography at the expense of all the other dimensions of the theory of semiotics became increasingly widespread. Then too, in a parallel sequence of events, 
There also began what I have called the ideology wars in architecture. As I have just noted, in 1978, uh, uh, Creer and Culo's rational architecture still included works by Coolhaus and by the Creer brothers um, on, uh, on adjacent pages. But in, by the time of the Charlottesville tapes, only four years later in 1982, you will find Creer on the one hand and Coolhaus on the other commenting contemptuously on each other's work in a conference at the University of Virginia. Even I came under attack in the intensifying wars between the increasingly beleaguered protagonists of postmodernism on the one hand and the newly rising tendency of deconstructivism. Here, for example, you see a cartoon drawn by a young architect who was a protege of Alberto Perez Gomez that was published in Architectural Design in 1979 mocking the concepts of typology that I had documented in my vacant lottery essay of 1978. You can see the, you know, you produce the city by just typing in the, foot, the building footprints with the spacer bar at the bottom producing the squares here and there from time to time. For the radical phenomenological followers of Perez Gomez in those years, my structuralist construct um, uh, my st any structuralist concept whatsoever was dismissed as pre-constituted and inauthentic. Uh, perhaps I may be permitted in parentheses to observe here how interesting it has been for me subsequently to realize that such intellectual luminaries as Claude Lévi-Strauss and Frederick Jameson have, like me, never seen the precepts of phenomenology and of structuralism as being mutually incompatible with one another. I could elaborate that, but we'd be here all morning if I did. In any event, by 1988, the advocates of deconstructivism had, as far as I can tell, won the war in question, at least on the plane of theory, and the, and the proof of their triumph was the deconstructivist architecture exhibition of that year at the Museum of Modern Art, curated by Philip Johnson and the then young Mark Wigley. Still, like others at the time, I quickly became aware uh, that the so-called Decon show uh, quite problematically included the work of a number of designers who, despite their agreement to participate in it, nevertheless quickly announced their puzzlement at why they had been invited to do so. Uh, <clears throat> what is more, it was by then beginning to be clear to me, as well as to other ob observers of the international architectural scene, that the new prestige of architecture that had begun so promisingly, or so at least it seemed to me, uh, with events such as the founding of the Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies back in the early 1970s, had already begun to go rancid, resulting in the troubling phenomenon that we have come to know as the star system. In the then new world of the star system, rigorous critical discourse began to give way to a sort of higher order public relations uh, produced by critics about the design production of the stars. And this was a praxis in which I was neither willing nor invited to participate. Indeed, I have noted with some irony in the wake of the star system how much of the vocabulary of the architecture subsequent to, de to deconstructivism has proven as primarily iconography driven as, as postmodernism in its heyday ever was. In 1993, I was appointed to the senior faculty of the Graduate School of Design at Harvard, and 1995 saw the publication of my book, The Space of Appearance, a long overdue completion of an architectural interpretation of the thinking of Hannah Arendt thinking that had preoccupied me ever since my first discovery of phenomenology. Um, I should say um, I had a brief reunion last night with Roger Conover from the MIT Press, who's here to join in the celebration of the publication of Architecture School for the ACSA Centennial. And I reminded Roger of him telling me once that the um, 
the two best-selling books on architecture that the MIT Press has ever published are Kevin Lynch's The Image of the City and Steen Euler Rasmussen's Experiencing Architecture. And I can tell you that um, the space of appearance is nowhere close to competing with either of them. <laughs> Among those who admired the space of appearance was Colin Rowe, and it was as a result of his pleasurable reading of it that I was invited to deliver a keynote address at the Festschrift in his honor at Cornell University in 1996. This led in turn to the publication in Assemblage, of which Michael Hayes was the editor, <clears throat> in 1977 of my Festschrift presentation oppositions in the thought of Colin Rowe, and then indirectly to my status report on his influence, um, published in Zodiac magazine in 1999. Both of these, I am pleased to think, contributed to a recuperation of Rowe's intellectual reputation, which was very much in decline at that time. You will remember, of course, that in part as a result of the ideology wars I had just described, Roe had been abandoned and sometimes even attacked, even by his most intellectually influential protege, Peter Eisenman. Perhaps among the more consequential texts I published while at Harvard was an interview with me by the editors of Perspecta 32 in 2001. One of those editors was Brendan Morin, who's um, in the room with us here this morning. Um, uh, in that, I was invited to attempt to resituate my view of Cool House, looking back from the perspective of that date, i.e. 2001, to my earlier close contact with him in the 1970s. Then, in 2004, I published my essay, Criticality and Its Discontents, in the Harvard Design Magazine. This was a response to Robert Summels and Sarah Whiting's uh, text, Notes Around the Doppler Effect and Other Moods of Modernism, published in Perspective 33 in 2002. This challenge of mine to the young critics of the use of critical theory and architecture evidently struck a chord in a number of architectural circles. I was even invited to update my thoughts on the critical at a seminar in Shanghai. Last year, I completed my most recent book, Public Space, Cultural Political Theory, Street Photography, and in it, I have attempted to render more concretely specific some of the arguments of the closing chapter of the space of appearance. I want to end this apologia with a restatement of my convictions in respect to the phenomenology of architecture. One of the enduring lessons I have learned from Hannah Arendt has to do with the importance of etymology. <clears throat> Despite the too often glib skepticism of post-structuralism, the meanings of words do continue to matter, and therefore etymology still matters. Consider for a moment the fact that the words edifice and edify come from the same Latin root. I take it from this that even the most modest architectural design constitutes a profound statement as to the possibility of architecture to posit not just a better world, but even in some mysterious sense, an ideal world. In this regard, I can cite the wise observation of Theodore Adorno from 1964. Architecture worthy of human beings thinks better of men than they actually are. I find myself, after nearly 50 years teaching architecture, here in Boston accepting the topaz medallion of the ACSA and the AIA. <clears throat> I admit that I still don't know altogether what to make of it. In my puzzlement, let me cite a copy of the previously confidential nomination letter that was recently sent to me by a friend and Topaz nominator, Sarah Whiting. 
<clears throat> this letter of Sarah's reminded me of another lesson I learned from Arendt. This is that we come to fully to understand even our own personal identity only within the discourse in which we engage with others around us. This is one of the most important dimensions for Arendt of our participation in public life. In her gracious letter of nomination of me, Sarah Whiting observed, and now I quote from her, having recently stepped down as dean at the University of Toronto, <clears throat> excuse me, the University of Toronto, I wonder if George has had a moment to reflect upon the impact he has had upon so many students of architecture over all of those years. This medal might finally give him that pause. Sarah, you are not with us here this morning, but you do indeed have the last word. Thank you. Thank you.